Dear alumni, audience in front of the screens, good evening. Welcome to this CKGSB dialogue. My name is Zhang Xiaomeng, Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior, Associate Dean for EE. The executive education is a great platform and a lifelong learning platform for business leaders from CKGSB, business leaders from different walks of life, different ages, from different backgrounds of science and technology, cultural innovations, have found new ideas through our programs. So for this dialogue, we are providing a unique topic to the topic to the audience, namely leadership in the midst of uncertain times. We have the honor to have invited the co-founder of NPLI, Professor Leonard Marcus, and also the Associate Dean of Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Professor Eric McNulty, to cover this topic. In order to give you the best experience and to make sure that we can make this work. I will be speaking both English and Chinese, but we also are offering simultaneous interpreting services. So a few words about the background of the two professors. Dear Professor Marcus, dear Professor McNaughty, good evening. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to have you in CKJSB Dialogue on Leadership in the Midst of Uncertainty. This is Xiaomeng from Changkang Graduate School of Business. First of all, please allow me to introduce you to our Chinese audience online. Professor Leonard Marcus is the founding co-director of the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative at Harvard University, and he is an internationally recognized authority on leadership during times of crisis and change. Welcome, Li. Thank you very much. And also we have Professor Eric McNaughty is the Associate Director of the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative and the instructor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Welcome, Eric. Welcome, thank you very much. And Professor Marcus and McNaughty just published a new book, You Are It, congratulations. And they will talk about the major findings of the new book and introduce the concept of meta leadership in their keynote speech today. So for the best interaction with the audience, I will uh, speak Chinese for my keynote speech and then switch back to English for our dialogue. Okay. Okay, now I screen share uh, the presentation slide. So first of all, I would like to present um, building resilience in the era of uncertainty. So the COVID-19 is hitting the world and everyone, every family, every business and every country. So this uncertainty has become the new normal and we expect organizations and individuals to be more resilient with more leadership. So in the time of crisis, what kind of leadership is needed and how can we build our psychological resilience is the topic that we want to cover. So in the face of COVID-19, Chinese business leaders have undergone a lot of psychological changes. So with many alumni from CKGSB, I have talked to them a lot and we did a questionnaire to look at these uh, psychological resilience before and after reopening of the employees and the business owners. So we, you can see that the timeline is from February to April 2020. And uh, we uh, did the questionnaire with employees and the different uh, executives, including business leaders from our CEO programs. We looked at the problems they have and also their next generation, especially uh, their children from our relay program. So we also looked at business leaders from the ASEAN program and uh, also the executive program from real economy, 
many of them have different psychological response of COVID-19. We received 6,974 uh, questionnaires with over 500,000 data. The report is released online, so you can scan the QR code and read the full report. In the interest of time, I am going to cover some highlights of the data we have identified. First of all, distribution of the full sample. So according to our research, the average score is 29.97 from 0 to 40. So the full score is 40 of a psychological resilience. So how do we interpret this? If we look at um, surveys in the past of Chinese business leaders, for example, also the psychological resilience of uh, medical staff, it was around 28%. For customer service support, support staff, it was 26 And victims of uh, earthquake was 24.8. And the paternal women psychological resilience was 29. So in the background, we can notice that these business leaders and the employees are quite at high levels of their resilience. So 43.82% of them, namely over 2,000 of them, are at the average level from 0 to 29 points, and around 38% are at high levels from 30 to 36 points. We also have 1,087 are at extreme high level of resilience from 37 to 40 points, accounting for 18.63% of the total sample. Also, very interestingly, we have noticed that there is a relationship with the anxiety and depression levels of the samples. We can notice from the slide that for the high resilience sample, they have very low they have much lower levels of anxiety and depression, much lower than the average level even, compared with the anxiety of 5.2. The high resilience level has only 1.63 levels of the anxiety, and it is the same with depression levels. So we can notice that there is a close relationship between anxiety and depression and their psychological resilience. We have also noticed that with different age groups, there is an increasing trend of psychological resilience. In the group of people above 40 years old, they have much better performance in resilience. From 50 to 59 years old cohort, they have the best performance of resilience. And also they can manifest in different ways in seniority. So the business owners have the highest level of resilience and the pool part is the ground level employees and they account the most share of low resilience. Besides the seniority, we also found some gender differences. So this is the gender comparison Comparison. We have noticed that male did better in resilience. In the high resilience cohort, more are men. And in the low resilience cohort, less are men. They account for less than 50%. But even more interestingly, if we look at, if we put gender and seniority together, the difference is quite uh, the other way around. So this shows distribution of resilience by both gender and the seniority. So the scores are still 0 to 40. The blue line is for men and their resilience point at different seniority. And the orange part is for women at a different seniority. So the executive, women executives, including women presidents, are much better, are better than their male counterparts. 
the biggest difference and biggest gap shows in the ground level management. So I think we need to pay more attention to the mid level management women managers and basic level women managers. I also um, had a talk at the UN Women Leadership Forum last November. So it's also in line with the notion of her leadership. By the end of 2019, I took my team and published the research on Chinese executive leadership transformation 2019. So on this report, we did the survey of over 4,300 uh, alumni in our executive programs from the executive courses and the CEO courses and relay courses and EMBA programs. We looked at their characters and factors of leadership, including their sectors, their locations. So we have identified that men and women are becoming very similar in their leadership. So in a non-work environment, men and women are quite similar. But once in a work environment, women in three different perspectives are very different than men. So I would like to cover these three differences. First of all, it's age. Age is holistic. So women in balancing are more holistic in balancing HR and in their management style, but men are more eager to uh, reach their goals. The second is empathetic. Women are more empathetic than their male counterpart to look at re their relationships with their uh, colleagues and that they are more patient. So women executives are more patient and empathetic in their management styles. They pay close attention to interpersonal interactions and the harmony with their teams. And the last one is resilient. So when we look at data of stress, women executives are usually having more stress than their male counterpart, but they are more resilient. So more often, women executives are uh, sco scoring more in their satisfaction level from the employees. So this is going to be published in the Chinese edition of Harvard Business Review too. So moving on, women have more stress, but they are also more resilient. So this is very in line with the her leadership study we did last year. Compared with male presidents, we identified that women presidents in the face of extreme stress are actually more resilient. So from the slide, you can see that people at different seniorities have a different uh, uh, resilient leadership uh, performances. So women did best in the at the the president level and the men did the best in the mid-management level. So where's the source of their stress? In our questionnaire, we have found that the three major stress sources are the pandemic, finance, and also their workload. So we can also find the solutions. The top threes are exercising to de-stress yourselves through working out. The second one is work. And the third one is very interesting, is to talk to your family and friends. Over half of the uh, survey of the participants said that they would take this way to de-stress themselves. So we also found that there are two other uh, study results. The yellow line here shows the, how much time they spent on, uh, how much time they spent with their family and friends, and the, the correlation was their stress level. So we can see that if they don't talk to their friends or colleagues or family at all, they are much, they are under much more stress. But 
Even if it's just 30 minutes or half an hour of uh, uh, time spent with family, they are much better at stress level. And also, if they don't talk to their friends and the colleagues at all during the pandemic, they are much less loyal to their uh, to the employers. So we can see that there is a big difference. So people to people connections, interpersonal rel relationship is the key factor in resilience. The same here, if you don't talk to other people, if you don't have any connectivity with others, then the share of low resilience is the blue part here as much as 40%. But with more time spent on connectivity, the share of low resilience decreases and the share of high resilience increases. I don't have enough time to share with you everything of the report, so I only covered some of the highlights, which is about the topic today. So this is our model. Through our research, we found that in the time, in the era of uncertainty, resilience or to build up your resilience depends on three factors, your self-recognition, connectivity, and the control of the situations. So as individuals, we need to fully understand ourselves, first of all, to know where are your strengths, what are your needs, to adjust to the environment and to adjust our behaviors. And after that, after understanding and gaining skills, we need to learn how to control the uh, situation that has changed. And finally, through your connections, you can build up your resilience. I also want to share with the audience and the alumni that the three factors here are actually covered in the book of Your It by the two speakers through meta leadership. So I will switch to the two professors. They are going to cover and share with us their research. Okay, uh, Lini and Eric. So the, the presentation I just made is about my uh, latest research on psychological resilience. Um, uh, of Chinese business leaders and their employees during the coronavirus. Uh, you know, it's extremely interesting that I find out the three uh, critical factors in my research, self-awareness, situational control, and relationship building are highly relevant to your new book about meta leadership. So leadership is all about influencing and empowering others to concur uncertainties. So would you please share it more with our Chinese audience about your new book on meta leadership, please? You're muted, Lenny. Well, thank you very much. And it's very interesting to hear about the research that you're doing uh, in China uh, and the work that we're doing here in the United States. And this is particularly relevant because what we are facing right now as humanity is a global pandemic. Uh, certainly your experience in China, our experience in the United States and the experience of people around the world. So for us, it's particularly uh, meaningful to be able to be in dialogue with you around the other side of the globe. Our work that Eric and I will be, Eric McNulty and I will be presenting today is on meta leadership. And very importantly, the prefix meta in English means looking at a problem from a very wide perspective and then building solutions as a leader from a very wide perspective. This is very related to psychological resilience because as a leader, our definition is people follow you. And so part of your responsibility as a leader is to create the conditions in which people are more likely to be resilient. So through your research, understanding what are the factors that encourage resilience is critically important. And we're thrilled to hear how well it complements our interests and our work on meta leadership. There are three dimensions to the practice of meta leadership. If you can imagine this as circles, the middle circle is about you, the person of the meta leadership. It's your emotional intelligence. It's the commitment and the devotion 
uh, that you bring to your work and its purposes, and it's in part your psychological resi resilience. One of the things that we say about a, a leader in times of crisis is that you need to believe that I can do it. Because if you as a leader don't believe that I can do it, there's no way that you're going to be able to convince and persuade other people that they can do it too. Or in other words, your resilience is a factor that determines or influences the resilience of other people. The second dimension of meta leadership is the situation. You as a person are surrounded by a situation. You didn't necessarily create the situation. However, it is your responsibility to understand it and then strategically to figure what needs to be done. As a meta leader, you're leading in multiple directions. In part, you lead down to your subordinates, the people who call you boss, and you're responsible for their activities, their productivity, and their resilience. You also lead up to your boss. Our definition of meta leadership, people follow you as a subject matter expert, um, as an, someone who understand what's going on in the surroundings, in the situation, your responsibility is to brief your boss on what's going on and what needs to be done. In particular, for example, if you're leading up to a political figure. And then horizontally, you lead across to other departments and components within your organization to build connectivity within your organization. So all its different components are working together and leveraging one another. And then you lead beyond to organizations outside of your own. It could be to government agencies, could be to other businesses and companies that are part of your supply chain because your supply chain will be as resilient as the other companies who are part of this. The key to making meta leadership a success is how can I help make you a success? And if everyone in your system is oriented toward mutual success, your chances of achieving that are greatly enhanced. Eric? Thank you, Letty. And of course, one of the factors that differentiates a crisis from normal times is the level of complexity. You know, we tend to think of our world as relatively static. We do our planning in very linear ways, yet a crisis throws that all up in the air. If you think about our situation right now, we not only are worrying about the virus, but the medical and social response to the virus, the economic implications, which includes both your relationships within the company, between workers and managers, as well as with your customers. You think about the economic, the, uh, the, the familial uh, relationships that have been shifted as well as people have been perhaps working from home, other things have changed. So we have all these different dynamics playing out in the system. And it's being able to deal with that complexity that differentiates the effective crisis leader from the not so effective one or just the crisis manager who's thinking about the bits and pieces. As a leader, you have to be thinking about the relationships. That's why it was so important in the research we just heard about, the emphasis on relationships, not just at work, but at home and in the community, that that builds overall resilience and your ability to grasp that complexity, accept it and work with it is part of what will make you successful as a meta leader. It, that starts with you as the person, Lenny. Well, part of uh, your research showed uh, the whole question of anxiety. And when we're in a crisis, especially an unprecedented crisis, such as the global pandemic that we're experiencing right now, anxiety is an important part of the experience. So as a leader, and when this pandemic hit, every leader of every company, every organization, every university suddenly became a crisis leader. So as a leader, if you're able to uh, adjust and to regulate your own anxiety, you're much likely uh, be more successful in being able to support your workers, to support them going through st stressful situations. So meta leadership then begins with who you are, the person of the meta leader, and the greater discipline and balance, the greater perspective that you can bring in your own leadership the more likely you will be able to influence other people. We say that meta leaders create influence beyond authority. You can't order someone not to be anxious. You can't order someone not to be stressed. However, you can be an example of that yourself as a meta leader. You can encourage that kind of balance uh, for people who are following you, and therefore you can make your organization more resilient as well. Eric? And the second dimension, as Lenny mentioned, is the situation. And leadership is so contextual. 
the, you know, the situation in which you find yourself will determine how you need to show up in order to get the outcome you're trying to achieve. And one of the things that differentiates the, the book and our work on mental leadership is how we've done the research that you'll find there, which is that letting myself and our colleagues deploy into the field in the midst of crises to be with leaders in the middle of the action to see what really stresses them, what's difficult uh, contingencies they weren't expecting, helping watching them uncode and, and figure out, as Lenny mentioned, what's happening and therefore deciding uh, what to do about it. And what we found is that there is a, a, a continual discipline process they go through. Uh, we call it in the book, The Pop Doc Loop, and just very briefly, it's about perceiving and looking broadly, as Lenny mentioned, that meta perspective, taking in, seeing all the factors that are at play, orienting, where are the patterns? What does this mean? Understanding that, that deeper significance and sharing it with those around you, which then enables you to be able to predict what might happen next because patterns repeat. And if you can be predicting you're ahead of the situation, you would be able to be proactive and that those predictions will then tee up the decisions you're going to need to make. And then the operational implications of those decisions, how will you carry them out successfully? And then what you need to communicate throughout your system, both to you, you know, be it to your workers, your suppliers, your customers, whoever it happens to be. But going through that discipline process takes you through analysis and action, always recalibrating as you see the situation evolve around you. And to the extent that you can stay one step ahead of what's happening, you're much more likely to be effective, to have your business be uh, in a good position to actually to accelerate out of a downturn as we're seeing now with the economy, or to be able to respond effectively to the implications of something like the, uh, the coronavirus. Lenny? So the third dimension of better leadership is connectivity. And in a crisis like the global pandemic, it's not only your organization uh, that's under stress, it's other organizations as well. Your capacity as a meta leader to rally the kind of effort needed to meet and then overcome a crisis of this dimension requires connectivity, working together with other people. And as I said earlier, that connectivity operates in multiple directions. First off, you're leading down. You're creating a team. You want to leverage their capacity, understand their experience, and very importantly, as was mentioned in the prior research, demonstrate empathy to them. If you're empathic uh, with your subordinates, um, if you understand their situation, if you help them adapt to the crisis, they're going to be more uh, committed to the mission that you share. So you want to create a team among those people who are your subordinates. And when you're leading up to your, to your boss, your boss has significant responsibility and you can help your boss to be resilient. You can help your boss cope with the anxiety. You can provide information and recommendations and strategic imperatives to your boss that can be very helpful for the whole organization. So that if you're effectively leading down to your subordinates and effectively leading up um, to your boss, you're able to build connectivity. The organization itself is better connected and better able to adapt to the difficult situations in the crisis. Then being able to lead across so that your organization is really working together. You're able to leverage the knowledge, the resources, which could be personal protective equipment uh, or information or access to critical infrastructure. You're able within your organization to leverage everything that you've got. And then you're able to work with organizations outside, find how you can help in meeting their needs and what you they might be able to do to help you in uh, meeting your objectives, especially if you're working in a complex supply chain where so many organizations are being affected by the crisis and those organizations can be helpful to one another in being able to come up with a united front. If you as a meta leader build that connectivity of effort, the orientation of all those different people and organizations will be how can we help make you a success? How are we going to succeed together? And when you're coping with a crisis on the dimensions of a global pandemic, that capacity to leverage one another, to connect with one another, and to truly work together is key to the resilience of our populations. It's not only individual resilience, but it's also national and international resilience. And to the extent that this research can help you in charting out your pathways to resilience, we hope it will be useful to you. Eric? Of course, one of the, the things that 
is not often addressed in terms of leadership, and particularly crisis leadership, is the notion of time and how leaders can work with time. And you look at, you know, our, the book opens with the story of the Boston Marathon bombings, and those bombings were over in a matter of seconds. The entire incident was over in 102 hours. Uh, that's relatively brief. You contrast that with the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which was more than 80 days, and now the coronavirus, which is going into months and months and will likely be uh, more than a year till it is uh, fully under control. And understanding the dynamics of time and you know, speaking to our resilience, it's not about getting the most out of your people. It's about getting the best out of your people. And how do you keep them stronger longer and realizing how do you calibrate your response so you can maintain high, a high degree of performance over time it has to be sustainable and so that same approach that will get you through 102 hours is not the same one that will get you through 102 days or six or seven months or a year of a crisis and so that's something you need to be thinking about as a leader of, of how do i think about what we call the arcs of time when am I getting things done relatively quickly? When am I building the capacity for a sustained response, something that we have to take care of over months or years? And then how am I transitioning from one phase of the crisis to the next? And it, it's a very important process to go through. And again, it's part of having that larger view, that meta view of understanding that there are multiple components here. They're all in motion at different speeds. And you as a leader have to try and see as many as possible of those and understand how to pace what's going on there again there are times you'll be going really quickly you'll be driving hard and particularly for the you know reference to entrepreneurs earlier i've worked with entrepreneurs a lot um and they tend to you know go harder when things get tough they just try and go harder um that is good in the short term for a longer term you've got to go smarter and being able to rotate people through to be able to pace what's happening and as lenny mentioned draw upon the the resources of the larger system of your, of your suppliers, of your customers, of the government in some cases. Uh, what, what, what's going on internationally and how can you shift things around? So getting your head around the, this notion of time and how you're thinking about time. Where do you want to speed things up? Where do you need to slow things down? And how do you calibrate your actions appropriately across the arcs of time of any crisis? That is a, is a particularly in a uh, complex crisis like the one we're facing right now, is so, so important because if you, if you treat it like a sprint, you're going to fail. You've got to be thinking in marathon terms, be thinking much longer, keeping the pace playing out and, and leveraging all the resources in the system and keeping everyone, as I mentioned earlier, stronger, longer. And so that's uh, our, our, I think, Lenny, maybe the briefest overview we've ever given of, of all the work we've done over the last almost 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's uh, hopefully that is useful. We hope you find the book useful as well, which has many stories as well as some, some different tools you can use. Uh, Professor, let me turn it back to you. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Lenny and Eric. It's uh, very, very interesting to hear about the, you know, the ideas and the structure of the book. You know, personally, I find the the meta leadership, the concept, especially when you mentioned about the person, the situation, the connectivity, and how should we consider this complexity and the time issue is extremely important. I think now, you know, I have a better and a deeper understanding of your uh, ideas and the research on meta leadership. As Dini said, it's a wide, you know, perspective. So especially, you know, how should we look at the problems, the uh, opportunities and the solutions from, uh, from this wide perspective? Active. Well, um, a particular question that uh, I would like to hear from you is about the gender differences in the framework of meta leadership. As you know, you know from my research, according to the uh, survey result, women executives have shown stronger resilience in spite of their higher levels of stress facing the coronavirus. This also echoes my previous uh, study. We find out that compared to male leaders, women leaders had you know, higher levels of stress, but along with higher satisfaction level. So resilience may e explain part of this paradox. So I'm wondering uh, if this also happens in the US. So for women business leaders, how do they leverage gender advantages in their daily management and especially during the pandemic and the crisis? And what is the relationship between female leadership and the meta leadership? So, Lini and Eric? 
Well, that's a, uh, that's a, a, a big question. And I think that one of the things we have found is that the meta leadership framework uh, resonates particularly well with, with women uh, because of the focus on relationships. Uh, that notion of connectivity and building relationships throughout the system. You know, as you mentioned earlier, having a sort of holistic view of what's going on and, and, and the empathy. We, we talk a lot about emotional intelligence and your ability to relate well with people. And uh, as much as I don't want to use broad brush uh, gender characteristics, uh, that's, that gets you into big trouble. Um, but I think that, that we have seen that the, the more empathic approach to leadership, that more relationship based, you know, less of the singular superhero and more of the person who can bring everyone together and get them working in the same direction and working in harmony. Um, that has been a more uh, natural approach for, for many women leaders. Uh, it makes it difficult to fit into cult, some uh, corporate cultures where it's much more of a competitive uh, one against the other atmosphere. However, particularly in times of crisis and stress, that, that, that more relationship-based approach actually is hugely important. Um, and we've seen you know, when, when crisis teams come together in, in, a, in a company, often those people have not worked together a lot. You've got high performers who've been good in their individual functions and in their roles, and then you throw them together and they have to get good as a team really quickly. And you do that through those, again, the relationship building skills, uh, creating psychological safety, creating an environment where it is, you're comfortable together, you're able to, uh, to openly collaborate. And again, Lenny mentioned earlier, that notion of how can I help make you a success? So it's not the focus on me, it's the focus on you. And that brings people together. And so that very much fits into a space that I think f feels more natural to, to many women. Um, certainly we've seen that. And I think we, we've, uh, again, we've had a, quite a number of women come through our programs and they have found great resonance with the metal leadership approach for that reason. And they're like, yes, finally, something tells me what I was doing was the right thing all along. Lenny, do you have more thoughts on that? Yeah, just that, you know, many times when people think of leadership, they think of a pyramid. So there, this is the leader at the top of the pyramid, and then there are more and more people going down, and that is their definition of leadership. Well, that really doesn't incorporate what Eric just told about relationships and understanding motivation and resilience. And so the notion of beginning with the person of who you are as a leader and one of the things that we say is just because you have a fancy title doesn't necessarily mean that you're the leader. Uh, sometimes people with very, very prominent titles, people don't follow them. And so the kind of relationship building that, that you're talking about in your research and the resilience, uh, which is at the core of mental leadership, uh, so much is in conforming with your research findings. So not surprised at all to hear that you found those differences in resilience, in anxiety, the capacity to cope with stress. Those are absolutely critical uh, strengths uh, in, in a crisis. So yes, it, it very much conforms with the research that you've been doing. Well, I think, you know, I uh, think you, thank you so much for the responses. And, uh, you know, when I read the book, I think uh, when I look at the model of MET leadership, it's very exciting to see that, you know, as you said, the person in the middle and the influence is, is not only from top down, it's also about how you influence the people above, people down, people, you know, parallel. So it's a uh, 360 degree influence about the leadership. So, um, it's very interesting to know that the importance of this relationship building, as you mentioned in the dialogue, is one of the major successful reasons for uh, women leadership. Actually, you know what? In my research, I uh, interviewed hundreds of business leaders for both genders and find out actually one reason for women business leaders to show higher level of resilience is because they are willing to communicate more and they are willing to connect with others in adversity. So such communication and connection can help them to relieve certain degree of the stress of their own. And in the meanwhile, they love to help others and help to boost the employee morale in the company to cope with the crisis. Well, let me show you this. I will uh, share my screen. It's a very interesting um, finding based on our, you can, can you see the screen now? You see this? Yes. Okay. So let me show you this. So this is one of the findings we have during this uh, Corona uh, virus period. And uh, we, we find out that 
the top three ways for leaders to unite their teams and companies during this uh, epidemic situation. There are three ways. Number one is improving uh, epidemic prevent, uh, prevention measures, you know, which is understandable. Number two is clearly identifying strategic goals for the future. So, so basically the employee need to see the futures. Number three is top leaders and executives use different methods to boost employee morale. So um, let me stop the sharing. So I know that uh, Lini and Eric, I know that you have participated in a series of catastrophic crisis emergency response event, which is, you know, awesome when I read your letter including this uh, uh, Hurricane uh, Katrina in 2005, uh, H1N1 mm -hmm. influenza uh, pandemic in 2009, and also that famous you know, oil spill in Gulf of Mexico in 2010. And the, uh, the, uh, Eric mentioned the Boston Marathon explosion in 2013, and also, of course, the um, Ebola virus response in 2014. So you actually presented the practical process of crisis management and also the experience and the lessons learned in your new book. So with the resumption of work and also with the economic restart now, are there any particular advices that you would like to share with the Chinese business leaders and audience in terms of accelerating the recovery and how to adapt to the new normal of this uh, pandemic using the meta leadership framework or maybe any successful cases of u.s company that rebound their teams and their business that you would love to share with us please yes that, that's a very good question um and we, we're right now working with an industry that's facing exactly uh that question here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we are saying with them and uh, what we'll share with uh, business leaders in China is, is the first thing you need to understand to, to, uh, to uh, build upon your research, uh, Professor, mm -hmm. is understanding what motivates people. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and that really goes back to the complexity that Eric talked about. Uh, because different people are motivated by very different concerns. Some people are primarily motivated about their health and the health of their family. Uh, there are some people that are concerned about the economic welfare of their own job and their ability to support uh, their family. Um, other people are motivated by the well-being of the company. And so what we say in the Meta Leadership book is it's important for a leader to understand what motivates people and then to build solutions that align with that motives. If I ask you to do something and it doesn't conform with your motivations, you won't be enthusiastic about doing that. So first off, understanding motives. The second thing is to understand how to adapt your organization. We're not doing things the way we used to do. We're spending a lot of time on Zoom. Um, I just hired someone uh, for a project until the end of February. I very well may never meet that individual in person. All of our interactions are going to be on Zoom. So we have to adapt. We have to understand that we need to work differently. And the third important thing is to understand the public health implications of whatever you're doing. So if you want to uh, have people come back to work, you need to understand what will ensure their public health safety, what will ensure their safety when they come to work. If you have a large customer base out there, if you don't respond to and address their concerns for their health, they're not going to come to you um, as a company if you're providing a service. So it, it's important, therefore, as a meta leader, understand what motivates people. Be prepared to adapt and show that you're concerned about their health, uh, the health of the community. And if you do those things, you're more likely to be successful uh, as a businessman. If you ignore motivations, you'll be doing things, but nobody's going to follow you. And our definition of leadership is people follow you. If you don't adapt your operations to the new situations, you'll have what we call very high activity, but very low productivity. You'll be working and working and working, but you're not able to generate revenue and to engage in appropriate business for your company. And the third thing in terms of understanding health, 
One of the things that we're concerned about is that we will have a new surge, a new wave of cases that could cause us to go backwards so that once again, we're having to close societies uh, to enforce um, uh, stay at home orders that will close businesses. So we are all motivated uh, to improve the health of the population because only the improved health of the population, conformity uh, with mask wearing and physical distancing and all the activities that can reduce the spread of this disease is in all of our best interests. And if business leaders demonstrate that, uh, and if they're role models for that kind of concern for public health, their businesses will better su succeed, uh, their countries will better succeed, and we will be more resilient on the other side of this global pandemic. And so one of the questions people often have is sort of how do I, how do I adapt? How do I make, create the environment where we're able to adapt quickly? And that's all about the pivot. Um, and I'm sure we've got a, a few basketball fans out there. And if you think about a pivot, it's where the, the player actually has stopped moving. Uh, one foot is planted and the other foot is going to move. And usually you look up, you're holding the ball, you're looking to see how things are unfolding around you. And then you're making a decision. Am I going to pass the ball or am I going to shoot? But that move is only possible because you've decided to plant one foot and you're going to move the other foot. Otherwise, you're just running, but you're about to shift what's happening. And so you have to think carefully as a, as a business leader, what, what's that foot I'm going to plant? You know, and one of the things we have found effective is of a, a, a framework we call PVP, which is uh, what's our purpose? You know, how are we actually being useful to our customers, useful to communities beyond just making money, but how are we actually helping them solve problems and actually delivering value? If people are clear on that, that helps them under, gives them one point to focus. Then what are our values? What do we stand for as an organization? Uh, and are we living into those values? Again, if you can count on those values, it creates a bit of certainty amidst the chaos of a crisis. And then performance. What does success look like? How, you know, there's always distortion between the, the top of the organization where things may be clear and then the front lines where they are maybe a little bit less clear. And as a leader, you need to be working to create as much clarity as you can, removing distortion so everyone understands what's our purpose and we, why is this work meaningful? That keeps people engaged. What are our values that makes it worthwhile being together, being part of the organization? And then performance. What does success look like? How can we feel that we did our best during an even very difficult time. So if you can be clear about those three things, that actually builds a lot of adapt adaptability into the system because people know what they can count on, what's certain and solid. And yes, we may change our tactics. We may be working from different places. We may shift the products we're making. As we've seen, you know, numerous companies have gone from making you know, automobiles to making ventilators, from making uh, men's suits to making uh, masks and gowns. Um, you know, you can make those kind of shifts when you're clear on the really core principles that, that are holding the organization together and, uh, and everyone understands why you're together. They want to be there because it's an exciting, engaging time to be there. And then you actually can be ready to accelerate out of the downturn to deliver uh, value even now when times are tough. And so creating that clarity enables you to pivot. And that's how you build that adaptability into the system. Even in a large organization, you can create a lot of freedom when you when people know what they can count on and what's okay to, to move and, and and react to the market. Yes, yes. Well, it's very uh, interesting to hear about the adaptability. Both of you actually mentioned about this quite a few times, and also the you know interesting examples of the U.S. company they're doing the uh, we call the cross border uh, cooperation in Chinese is called the 跨界合作. Well, facing the coronavirus crisis, actually, you know many Chinese companies are also doing this a similar cross border. Uh, collaborations. But let me give you a very interesting example. Uh, one of our students, he is the president of this uh, hot pot restaurant chain. This is a very famous hot pot restaurant chain. And in February this year, when all the restaurants in China were required to shut down temporarily, they quickly initiated a strategic collaboration with the book selling company. So hot pot, book so it looks like they have no connections at all but they you know very much quickly initiated this uh, strategic collaboration with the book selling company and a delivery services company so basically deliver hot pot and book combos to the customer's home within an hour after 
uh, the customer put the order online. So this is, you know, exactly about the connectivity mentioned in your new book we talked about earlier today. So during the crisis, like sharing the information, resources, or even the organizational competences will boost a new way of uh, collaboration, business models, and even the governance systems. And just as what the Lini and Eric's new book suggested, you know, facing different situation, everybody is the leader. I really love this idea. Everybody is the leader. So a person who wants to grow leadership must learn to uh, embrace challenges and a crisis in order to survive and thrive. We need to seek a bigger picture. So it's also important to perceive beyond the obvious toward the understanding of how this uh, uh, multiple connected factors act and interact with each other. With that, we are not afraid of uncertainty anymore because we begin to master this complexity of what is going on and you take actions. So very interesting book and research. Thank you, Lini and Eric. Um, okay, a uh, time issue. At the end of today's uh, dialogue, I would like to uh, give our Chinese audience a short summary based on um, Lini and Eric's research and my research. So now I will switch back to Chinese. Uh, let me share my screen for the last slide. Okay, so switching back to Chinese, I would like to wrap up this dialogue. So this model pretty much sums up the dialogue today. It's also based on meta leadership yeah, from the book of Eric and Lenny, and also based on my research on resilience. So in the face of uncertainty, and when uncertainty has become the certainty now, we are all being challenged by losing our control, which means that everyone is a leader. So in the center, I have put it. As I said, that at individual level, uh, the improvement of your personal resilience is based on your adaptability of new environment and through your experiences and the skills you need to be better at control different situations and through the connection with the external people external different factors and that is the connectivity and it's also similar with the meta leadership model of person connectivity and situation so these are the key factors. Also at the organizational level, it is the same. First of all, individuals are with resilience and skills of resuming their resilience. So it's uh, not, the, for example, the pandemic is the change of the environment, it's not something one person or one organization can change. So at the organizational level, your positive experience uh, means that you can have better behavior situation matching for employees and you need to have clear strategic goals. As we have heard from the two professors, clear strategic goals is going to give the employees a clear vision of where you are heading and you need to pack your organizational goals with their individual goals and then you need to give the individual space to grow and to make full use of their comparative competitive advantages. As we heard from the two professors, people are different. We need to help them grow. The third factor is that within the organization, you need to have built up the connectivity and you need to connect with other external factors, namely organizational integration to move from individual resilience to organizational resilience. So in the end, I would like to say that 
So the change is here and uh, our weapon of the time is resilience because only change is unchangeable. So you, the leader, only change is unchangeable and only uncertainty is certain. So thank you again, Lini and Eric, for joining us in CKJSB Dialogue. Thank you very much again for being here and thank you for coming to the dialogue. See you next time. What do you want to do with your life? Here at CKGSB, we can provide you with a chance to change your career and change your life. For international students, it's a soft landing in China, followed by breakneck growth. For Chinese students, it's a chance to spread your wings and soar. Either way, you will be fully equipped to live your dream. It's the world-class CKGSB MBA program. At CKGSB, we have more than 40 faculty members. Most of them have taught in leading institutions around the globe. The faculty does world-class research, and research is enormously important for business because the business environment is changing all the time. It's the scope that I feel no other faculty can provide. These professors that are big CEOs and directors of their own, and they are so humble in teaching you. Our course is designed to help students see beneath the surface, taught by people who have been there and done that. I believe China is the market, and the only way to understand a culture is to fully immerse yourself into it. You go deep down into specific companies such as I do, Tencent, and how they've started and how they become what they are today. More than half of our alumni are at the chairman and the CEO level. Collectively, lead more than one-fifth of China's most valuable brand. I met some of the EMBAs as well, and they're very willing to share their experience with current students in CK. My mentor in CKJSB is the CEO of Shogo. Till now, we will have a courtly dinner or lunch together and guide me through my career. Whenever you are at a big table or at an event, chances are you're going to meet someone from CKJSB or someone close to them is from CKJSB. It's a very small community. It's very family-like. Business leaders need a truly global perspective, and that's why CKGSB has developed a global learning platform. CKGSB connects us with businesses, nonprofits, and academics around the world. We want to develop the next generation business leaders who are global in perspective and have an innovative mindset and capabilities. The entrepreneurial startup culture in CK is huge. I want to be an entrepreneur that makes real change the world. Individually, everyone is really ambitious and collectively collaborative. Your time here enables you the chance to meet and network with China's brightest movers and shakers and gives you the opportunity to fulfill your dreams. For the first time, I was seeing how wealth was created from nothing. That has given me the spark to do the same. CKGSB won't just give you an MBA. It will teach you how to create change. CKGSB prides itself on its friendly, collaborative atmosphere, small class sizes, and an active cohort that makes life as vibrant and exciting as the city that surrounds it. Here, you'll develop lasting friendships that go beyond the classroom. And that's why our favorite hashtag of all is changing career, changing lives. So this is the right opportunity to learn more about this country. Totally changed my way to see this world. Be different, be unique, and go out there and be passionate. So, what do you want to do with your life?